by reading your blog and, and having you in class and and even my own uh, experience in the public school system, um, you talked about the humanization and and the schools not being a place uh, uh, of a high degree of freedom uh, or free thought. And um, oh, how to put this? Um, do you do you feel or believe that but that there are people that um, are opposed to like these progressive movements in education being more student-centered. Uh, could you talk about that? Yeah, there definitely are. Um, when I first got into teaching, I thought um, that the revolution had begun, um, that there was going to be profound changes uh, toward a more student-centered um, uh, educational system. And for a little while there, uh, it was beginning to, you know, come into the schools. Teachers were, uh, and if I remember correctly, uh, the teachers who had um, become uh, uh, a part of this movement towards a student-centered uh, educational uh, system um, were enjoying the life of a teacher in ways that uh, I know my teachers uh, in, in uh, K-12 uh, didn't because um, part of what the movement was doing was it was giving, I guess you could say, the teachers intellectual freedom, um, that is to teach what they understood. The teacher was a student um, and the teacher was going out and learning all the time and that learning would become a part of what was going on in the classroom. Um, it wouldn't just be teaching from a textbook and teaching what some uh, other person said you needed to teach, but the teacher, for instance, teaching writing uh, would think about writing uh, from the perspective of self as a writer or by reading what other writers thought about the process of writing and the teacher would come in and feel okay that's what we're going to talk about today but at the same time um, posing it as probabilities as it, it seems like this is what it means in order to write a sentence what do you guys think let's try it and so it was uh, an approach where teacher and student were trying to figure things out together, the teacher being somewhat, you know, more verse maybe, but students certainly understood to be a um, contributing member to this discussion of how do we get done what we need to get done. It was problem solving, uh, again, um, with the teacher as a student, and the student is a teacher, um, but the teacher kind of having, uh, being known for having some expertise, not just authority, but expertise. Well, um, that didn't last very long, and I've got to say that the reaction to that was violent. It, it, it wasn't je just, um, you know, oh, I don't think that's the right way to go. Um, the attack was really an attack, uh, um, and, 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 and in English, it, it was part of the back to basics movement. Schools have really screwed up. You got these uppity teachers out there who are thinking for themselves, and they're not following the curriculum the way it should be, and kids aren't learning the basic skills. And basic skills was a push to go back to like, you know, let's uh, teach them uh, to memorize verbs. Let's teach them to memorize spelling words. It was really pulling students away from uh, being thinkers, participants in the learning process. Now, again, that clobbered me. I didn't believe that people were so mean and ugly that they would do that. That once, you know, we had found out that the better way, and again, there were there was a massive, you know, Piaget and Vygotsky and these other psychologists had really, you know, they were basically, they were, they were humanists, they were um, developmentalists, not uh, uh, behaviorists, all right? 
And in education, education has suffered terribly from uh, the likes of B.F. Skinner, who said, you can program people uh, to be good people. And, the good, and, and that programming would be the program that experts like us uh, know is the right programming. And since the big push to get back to the basics, you don't think things have gotten better since the big push? Um, and the basics? It, no, I don't think they have, and I think it's just become, uh, th there's been a lot of lip service given to, um, you know, uh, critical thinking, for instance, because, again, the most important part of uh, a, 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 a curriculum that is, uh, that recognizes the individual as being an important player, that isn't indoctrination, uh, that truly is education that is um, focused on human growth and development as an independent intellect, all right, um, that gets lip service. And, and again, critical thinking comes up in almost every document now that, for a long time, because nobody will argue that people shouldn't be critical thinkers. What they argue against is when you really try to teach it, yeah. all right, so it gets redefined. Um, and again, there are these ridiculous ways to, to train people to become critical thinkers, but um, that hasn't happened. And part of the reason, well, let me say that something good has come along, and um, it almost kept me um, going in, in being a professor of education, and that was the uh, new uh, um, uh, uh, CCSS, the Core Curriculum State Sanders, which if you, they're hated by, they were embraced by everybody when they first came out and now um, conservative politicians and educators are fighting like hell to rid us of the scourge. Um, the CCSS are pretty much real critical thinking oriented. Um, it's not about students learning a content, it's about helping students learn how to learn a content, all right? So the CCSS isn't content bound, it's really um, uh, thinking skills oriented, but why wouldn't anybody like that? Um, helping people learn, for instance, not what they should read, uh, but how they should decide what they should read not teaching people what they should get out of the text, but teaching people how to go about on their own getting meaning out of text. Uh, it, um, science, science would, it, it, under the new standards, there's a new set of science standards, I can't remember what the name of them is, but the idea is that people need to think scientifically, and if they can think scientifically, then they can read anything and understand what scientists have to say, um, not just what scientists have already said, because somebody figured out that scientists keep talking. <laughs> they, they, they keep figuring things out, right. and that what you learned in school oftentimes becomes passe very quickly. So how does a person become able to be science literate? The same thing with, with, with English. How do you become literate in the sense that you can read anything, all right, that's put before you, and that your degree doesn't just say, read these novels, read these poems, read these plays, but rather say, this person can read any of these plays, make sense of it for themselves, and enter it into a, 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 an informed conversation with other people, or that they can take what they've learned and use it to think about the, the elements of life that, to which those particular texts relate. Um, one more, there's one, there are a couple of things in those standards that just about knocked me over because I thought they were so simple and so commonsensical and, and so important and, and yet nobody would talk to me about them. Um, in fact, all the arguments I've ever had about the Common Core have been about who wrote them, 
what their motives were, and whether or not teachers can teach to them. Nobody would talk to me about the individual standards. In other words, is this a good standard? In other words, is this something every person should be able to do? So the mathematics standards start with a, um, a little uh, 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 discussion of the fact that students who learn mathematics well should be able to, and this is their word, argue with mathematics and argue mathematically. So, what do you mean they should be? Of course they should. You should be able to argue with the person that is trying to give you a rotten loan right. for better terms. And you should be able to argue about client climate change using the mathematics in order to argue against people who don't see it your way. Or even with yourself, maybe most importantly, uh, with yourself about whether or not your perspective on certain things are valid ones, you know. Right. Um, and, and so I thought, wow, that's really, that's, <laughs> that's so simple. Of course, that's what math, the only thing that you should learn mathematics for, not, not to be able to repeat an algorithm, but to be able to use that algorithm to help you make decisions. But again, those decisions based on critical thinking, and critical thinking is what? It's arguing with yourself. Yeah. Yeah. Steve, wait a second, Steve. That, that, you don't, I don't think you got it right yet. Uh, you know, uh, think about this piece of information. Do the numbers add up? No, they don't. So huh, change your thinking. Critical thinking is being critical about your own thinking. It's that simple. And who does that? A, a, a thoughtful person that wants to get it right. <laughs> right. And a person who wants to get it right wants to base their judgments on something that you could call truth. Wait a second, there it is, there's the rug, Gordon. Why don't people like the standards, and why don't they like me, and why don't they like, why didn't they like this push for, uh, because then people would be taught the skills and the knowledge and the dispositions that are needed to get at the truth. And there are a lot of people that don't want you to get at the truth. Uh, right. Religion. Right. All right? If, you, if people went about and they started thinking for themselves and they said, I'm only going to believe in that which I can understand to be true, well, they would have nothing to look for to find the truth in religion. Because yeah. they'd have to call God and he's not answering. All right, they have to, about um, the economy. Hey, I can feel it, it's pinching my toes. You know, I mean, I can't afford a good pair of socks. What the hell's going on? Right. So, Trump isn't telling me, you know what I mean? Yeah. Well, if, again, the truth would destroy the whole facade that holds up our current economic system. And if you can get people, if you can keep them believing that they are not capable of getting a truth for themselves, then they need authorities. Right. And that's not too bad, except that if you're lying and you're the source of truth, you have to be an authoritarian because you can't back what you're saying. You can't prove it to be true because it's not. And therefore you say, you accept what I say or you know, my way or the highway, all right? There's an interesting distinction that, that I can't remember who made it, but it, and it's between an authoritarian and somebody who's authoritative. And a person who's authoritarian basically said, doesn't have to explain anything to you. They just said, I know what's right, you do it. Let's have, you know, answers on a fill in the thingy, you know, standardized test, you don't have to believe in the answer, but you know which one's the right answer. Right. How could the right answer be one that you don't believe to be right? Well, you got to buy into the program that is school. All right. So anyhow, the authoritarian is that person who just tells you what it is and you don't question it. The authoritative person is the person who will explain it in detail, 
until you go, oh, I kind of see why you believe what you do. That makes sense. Or, you know what? You were going all right, but you got this point wrong and it screws over everything. It's not true. All right? But now you can have a conversation because everything's been put on the table that pertains to one either buying in or not buying in to the truth that is being presented. So, yes, the current system of education is anti-truth because the truth would cause people to do things differently than those who are trying to control them want them to do it. Well, now that's a pretty big indictment, and I'll probably, you know, I could end up in a in, in Guantanamo for <laughs> saying that, but that to me is the truth of the matter. That truth not only is something that people don't want, it, it's something that's dangerous to certain people, and those people seem to have a good amount of control over how things go in this world. All right. They, um, uh, as you were talking, uh, just finishing up there, it made me think of something that I thought about earlier when you were talking, we mentioned foreign policy. A friend at work uh, has trouble speaking English. He's from Guatemala. And uh, there was just an article the other day on the internet. I saw that um, 18 uh, guys were arrested for their uh, War crimes. Uh, for what? For their war crimes and their civil war. Oh, in Guatemala. In Guatemala. So I showed Jose, Jose Yuma, and I said, uh, "Did you?" I, did, I said, "Are you up on this stuff?" I said, "I just know this article about the country where you're from." And he goes, "Oh, well, he goes, yeah, we had 50 years of civil war, you know, and uh, and a lot of it was over um, uh, the workers' wages and the uh, the the." Uh, World Fruit Company, I can remember, you know, what United, United Fruit. Fruit. United Fruit. Um, but anyway, uh, and I, I kind of knew a little bit about it just because of some of that reading I was telling you about that I did. Uh, but to me, that's just an example right there. Nobody, no, you talk to people, nobody knows anything about Guatemala or the, or the war or how we backed. The, uh, Guatemala, Nicaragua, Costa, oh. not Costa Rica, um, Chile, uh, um, every, almost every, Cuba, all right, every one of those countries in the 19, when, what, well, every one of them was, and I, I'll give it Hawaii, oddly enough, know, um, all of those countries were, their governments were basically um, dethroned uh, by, with the help of Americans because the governments were becoming what you could call progressive and humanistic, trying to make their countries a pl places where the people who live there could live decent lives. Right, and, I, I, I think, and there was money to be made. Well, right. that's why. Yeah. yeah, and that's why. But as you're thinking, you see, uh, to me, there just seems to be a real connection there between what you were saying in the schools and the truth. I mean, if, if people knew the truth, it, well, they would cause some problems. That's right. And, and I gotta say, you know, when people like me, or uh, there's a guy named Stephen Kinzer who, whose books I've been reading, um, uh, the one that I'm, I'm reading now is about, this is funny that you raised Guatemala, uh, but it, it's about all of the different uh, countries whose governments we have either overthrown or helped to overthrow and the reason why is pretty much unknown to the American people. Right. It's always uh, uh, said to be that we are the most humane country in the world and we are trying to help them find the good life that they have. But when in reality every one of those um, uh, uh, coups was sponsored um, at the behest of American business. Uh, in Chile, it was uh, um, International Telephone and Telegraph, the um, uh, company that, uh, out of which AT&T was spawned. Um, if you look at, uh, um, uh, I'm not sure in Guatemala, but 
um, in, in, that was Chile in uh, Cuba. It was the sugar uh, there. You know, everywhere you go in that part of the world, um, it, it had to do more with economics and a few people manipulating the minds of the American public to believe that it was in their best interest, all right, uh, and best interests of the people who we were civilizing, really exploiting. Now again, if you have a school system and it's going to get people to think critically, right, and to look at, you know, I've, I'm, none of this stuff's hidden, right, I can find it myself. I was just thinking of a book that I, it's uh, The Bitter Fruits of, uh, or something like Stephen Kinzer again, talking about that part of the world, Guatemala. Um, there's another book uh, uh, by um, a, 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 a guy who's a Latin American author, Gallegos, who uh, it, it says something like uh, tapping the, the veins of uh, Latin America, where he talks about how not only... Oh, the open veins. The Latin open America. veins. Yeah, I read that book. Yeah, that's a really good. Do you like that? Oh, yeah. Yes, I have a book. Now, if you bring that up, you will be called a propagandist and you're, you know, anti-American. Communist. Right. And, and I got to say this, that, you know, I used to feel that I was a bad American. I really did for many years. Um, I was convinced by uh, a lot of people that I was just not, I, that I, I hated my country. And, and then I went back and I read, you know, as much as I could, uh, 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 about the founding of the country, about the principles, about the people. And I realized that I thought more like those people than the people who were calling me anti-American did. Yeah. All right? And so I've become, I claim to be, in my, what is called radicalism, um, uh, a, a true American. I prize my, the fact that I'm an American because I really like what the country in principle stands for. Right. And here's the song. I get all kinds of flack from people. <laughs> like, you know, you, and again, you know, you, I don't, how, I don't know how, but I went through a period, and this has to do with humanization, where I was totally dumbfounded. I could not understand who I was or where I lived because um, it, I grew up during the Vietnam War, and my generation was told, if you want to be a good American, you got to go fight. Okay. Well, I was also told that human life was valuable. Yeah. And people were coming back in, in caskets and droves. I really didn't, I, I, I wanted to see what it was like to live this life. And here were these people saying, you're acting illegally. Why? Because you're protecting your own life. You're a chicken. Yeah. And you remember they, the peace sign, they said it was a chicken's foot. Yeah. All right. And you're unpatriotic. And then I finally figured out that resisting that draft was the most patriotic thing a sane person could do. Right. If that is being patriotic meant that you lived in America that lived up to what that Declaration of Independence says. Right. With that. <laughs> I think I'm going to close right there. That's a, that was a powerful statement, and uh, I'm afraid uh, the, the cameras are... Yeah, we're, 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 we're slaves to technology. Now. But uh, um, I, well, I really appreciate the time. I really appreciate you um, uh, giving me the opportunity to put you uh, well, down I don't on know. the hard drive there, and, and we'll see how this turns out, and I'll uh, let yeah. you see it. But uh, thank you, and... Um, uh, May the force be with you. Yeah, that's, that's what we all say these days. <laughs>